Um, I now, before we, uh, before I brief you, I, uh, I want to turn to our guest, in fact, to Akim Steiner, who is here to talk to you about the result of UNDP's People's Climate Vote. So, Akim, uh, you have the floor, and then we'll do our regularly scheduled briefing. Akim, please go ahead. Thank you, Stefan. Quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Thank you very much. Obviously, in the context of what is happening in our world, I think um, all of you as correspondents um, will have noticed the number of reports that are being published in the lead up to the Glasgow conference um, of the parties on climate change. And what we are releasing today is, in a sense, a contribution that um, takes a particular focus on where our citizens are, in fact, both viewing the challenge of climate change and particularly focusing on the question also of young people. Um, you may recall that the survey is a continuation of an original People's Climate Vote that was published in January this year and was the largest survey of public opinion on climate solutions ever conducted. And now in October, we are in view also of the forthcoming G20 summit and the significance of the G20 countries, focusing on these countries in particular and trying to disaggregate the data and particularly focusing on youth. Now, all of you have heard the Secretary General speak to the Code Red for Humanity that he has used when he commented on the release of the IPCC report. The latest UNFCCC report on nationally determined contributions, these national climate strategies that countries have been developing uh, for the Paris Agreement, also shows that we are indeed still on a catastrophic trajectory to a 2.7 degrees of heating. The latest IPCC report showed that the window to correct course is very narrow. We're almost out of time. And it is particularly amongst the younger generation that uh, basically skepticism about commitments is turning into frustration and anger. Indeed, actually, this morning, as I returned into New York City, I found myself, by coincidence, um, caught in a major traffic jam because apparently there was a major protest both on the Western Highway of Manhattan and the FDR on climate change and, and blocking traffic. I think we have seen uh, across the world young people increasingly questioning the seriousness with which we are tackling climate change. So our poll is in part an attempt to try and understand better where do young people in particular, and in this uh, press release today, young people in the G20 view what is happening and how they can relate to it. Now, as you also know, much of what we will hear and have heard over the last few weeks and will hear in the next few weeks and in uh, Glasgow uh, will obviously feed that frustration because clearly we are not acting either fast enough nor acting collectively sufficiently in unison. But it is also important to remember and also to look at some of the empirical facts that are important. The Paris Agreement has designed into it a ratcheting up mechanism. It is now in Glasgow that countries have been requested to come with their NDCs, these nationally determined contributions, and deliver more ambition. This is the only way that the reality can catch up with the science, and the Paris Agreement designed that into it. As of a couple of days ago, 143 NDCs have actually been submitted, and this is a good sign. It is the majority of the world's nations. And hidden behind the aggregate and average data, lie many extraordinarily bold uh, commitments by individual countries to raise their level of ambition, often led by some of the countries that are most threatened with their future in a world of growing climate change threats. We have also seen civil society being engaged as never before, and particularly the young, and that is why we believe it is a genuine effort to bring to this public debate the views of young people. They cannot often vote yet because they're not of voting age. They are not asked, and they have often a sense that they have no means by which to express themselves or the fora. And therefore, as we look to the summit um, that the G20 will organize, we believe it is important to bring some more understanding of where the youth in these individual countries stand. UNDP and the University of Oxford published the results today of this climate vote, this people's climate vote, and I want to turn to Cassie Flynn, who has been leading that effort within UNDP, just to give you a couple of the major findings and highlights. Um, Cassie, over to you. Thank you so much, Administrator Steiner. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to be here. 
And to build on uh, what the administrator was saying, I would just want to give a few headlines of what we've seen with this deep dive into how are young people considering the climate crisis and how do they want their governments to solve it? Because those are the two questions that, that we asked. Do you think climate change is a global emergency? And how do you want your government to solve it? And we gave a series of suggestions, uh, options that they could choose from between cutting emissions, adapting, and then also being able to uh, engage in financial aspects of, of the economy when it comes to the climate crisis. And the signals were very clear. 70% of young people under the age of 18 consider the climate crisis a global emergency. They want it solved now. They want their leaders to not hesitate. They do not want any delays. And then when we asked, well, what are the policies you want to see your governments enact? Really, five policies rose to the surface. And they are conserving forests and nature, clean energy, climate-friendly farming, more electric cars and buses, and more access to bicycles, and then green jobs and more investment in green businesses. And so from even these top five, you can see a real diversity and a real holistic nature of how young people are thinking about the climate crisis. That it's just not one silver bullet, that it is many, many different things that have to come together. We also saw this really play out across a number of countries where you see some of these issues being often in the news. So for example, um, in, in Brazil, we saw very high uh, support for protecting forests from young people. 69% of young people want to protect the forests in Brazil. In the United States, 74% of young people said they want more clean energy. Uh, this is something that they see as a, a key priority for, for their future. Likewise, in Australia, 81% of young people said they want more access to clean energy. And in Russia, protecting forests came out at 69%. And so you can see here that young people are starting to engage. They are seeing the climate crisis in real time. They're seeing how it's going to affect their lives and their livelihoods in the, in the years and decades to come. And they're being quite specific now about what they want governments to do in order to, to solve this crisis. So thank you so much. And Administrator, back over to you. Let me just end by saying what happens in the next few weeks is obviously not the end of the story, but what we see particularly coming out of the G20 is fundamental to also putting into value, or to use the French expression, mise en valeur, the efforts of all the others around the world. As you know, the G20 account for um, close to 75% of emissions, 80% of the GDP in the world, and 90% of vehicle sales. So when we are discussing major shifts in technology, mobility, what happens in the G20 matters. And even as of today, some G20 countries have not yet submitted their NDCs. And I end by simply saying to all political leaders around the world, these are the voices of the voters of not in 10 years time, but literally in one or two or three years time. These are the consumers of tomorrow. These are also the people who will shape either a joint effort on climate change in our societies or they will increasingly resort to a frustration agenda, going onto the streets in protest and essentially disengaging from the political process. So this is an important moment and, again, an important reminder to the G20 that their leadership matters not only within their own countries, but, in fact, to the whole global effort on climate change. Stefan, back to you. Thank you very much. We'll now take some questions. Uh, Joe Klein, Canada Free Press. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, my question really relates to um, the recent reaccreditation of the UNDP by the Green Climate Fund um, and the fact that the uh, uh, UNDP is the GCF's biggest implementing partner. Um, there's been some questions raised about this in light of unresolved corruption allegations in Samoa, Armenia, and Russia relating to UNDP projects and an audit indicating some weak internal control frameworks and poor accountability, including the lack of a robust anti-money laundering policy implementation. Uh, so could you please provide the current status of these issues in light of this recent reaccreditation by the Green Climate Fund? Thank you. Well, 
while today's press briefing is about the People's Climate Vote, let me briefly say I think the fact that the Green Climate Fund has re-accredited UNDP after a 12-month process of examining our policies, our track record, our performance, I think speaks for itself. This is a sovereign decision by the GCF board, and it is based also on a number of independent reviews that have been undertaken by, um, you know, accountancy firms. The fact that um, in a portfolio that we manage at any point in time of 4,500 to 5,000 projects, there will be people who will try to cheat the system. Um, what we have in, a, in many ways tried to uh, learn lessons from this time and again is how do we deal with these risks, how do we manage accountability. And I think member states rightly ask very hard questions of an institution that essentially is one that is entrusted by literally well over 100 countries to assist them in implementing these projects. None of these GCF projects are projects where UNDP is the determinant in the decision on whether we are chosen as an implementing agency. That is a sovereign decision by the countries. They examine their potential partners, and I think the vote of confidence that UNDP has received over the years, and I think again through the reaccreditation, demonstrates something very clear. We have an enormous amount of trust and confidence in the work that we do, and yet we will have instances when people try to cheat the system. It is clearly for me and my team and the leadership in UNDP to ensure that in those moments we act with consequence, with transparency, and that we have done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hakim. Um, any questions on the screen or in the room? Okay, Akim, I'm, uh, thank you for your thank you for your patience, um, and thank you for the for the report. And we hope to. And I know we'll be seeing you again uh, with us uh, later this week. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.